The record of human history begins in the city. And for more than 5,000 years, the city has reflected man's nature and achievements. For the city is man. Man multiplied, man magnified. Ancient peoples conceived the city as an image of heaven, made visible in sacred buildings and works of art. Ever since, the city has been the focus of man's attempt to realize the image of heaven on earth, to achieve his highest potentials in works of art and thought and love. Sometimes the promise of the city has come close to fulfillment. Too often, injustice, violence, and war have made it more hell than heaven. Today, the ancient image of the city has grown dim and confused while a better, modern image has still to be formed. But against all present threats, the promise persists, radiating from the great cities over the whole planet, drawing men to their centers. were made roughly 400 years before Christ, probably. Jesus Christ satisfies, saves, keeps, and satisfies. I can tell you that he came into my heart, took my sins away, gave me peace. Orange and lemon, says the bells of St. Clement. I owe you five farthings, says the bells of St. Martin's. And when shall I pay you? When I grow rich. The ordinary daily routines of life can go on almost anywhere. But only in the city can a full cast of characters for the human drama be gathered together in complex and varied patterns that transcend mere survival and release us from the daily routines.
Like a magnet, the city draws people from a multitude of regions and backgrounds, and in bringing them together, the city gives to each individual some of the strength and character and color of the whole. The city provides them with occasions for sharing their emotions in a way that magnifies the human experience as life in no town or village can. If the city is capable of magnifying all of man's highest feelings, it may magnify also all his most violent and destructive emotions. Today the city is a mixture of the new creative and the old destructive forces, ranging from helpful cooperation to brutal regimentation, from warm-hearted communion to savage violence. If man himself is to survive today, he must strengthen the creative elements in the city. To understand our troubles, it's not enough to look only at the city today, now. We must look also at the city in history, for the city is a living organism, and even the newest, rawest city carries in it some seeds from the first cities which began to appear on this planet about 5,000 years ago. The origins of the city are obscure, and in trying to trace them, we must fall back on fragmentary evidence uh, and a good deal of conjecture. Three major elements seem to have drawn men into their first temporary meeting places. Ages before cities, to say nothing of villagers, appeared. 
The first magnet was the burial ground, to which nomadic man returned at intervals to commune with the spirits of his forefathers. The second magnet was the ritual center, a shrine, a cave, with wall paintings, perhaps, or a sacred grove. Here, on special occasions, awe, reverence, pride, joy, were magnified by art and by communion with other people. Finally, there were the practical needs that brought families and tribes together seasonally at hunting or fishing camps or at reliable sources of pure water. So we see that Two of the three original motives for temporary settlement had to do with sacred things, not just with physical survival. These life-enhancing elements carried over through the village into the city, gave it unique potency in the minds and spirits of men. Always man keeps hold of his past in order to give continuity to his future. It would be wrong to neglect the element of physical survival, the economic needs, for it brought a form of understanding and cooperation with nature that gradually changed the occasional communal meetings of nomadic man into the first permanent farming settlements, the agricultural revolution, the development of which made civilization possible, began about 10 or 12,000 years ago in many places around the world. And there were long, shadowy ages of developing village life before the emergence of the early city. In the river valleys of Mesopotamia, have been found the stone carvings that give us our most complete records of the emergence of the city. In that sun-scorched land, the rivers which turned the bordering desert green were life. The water container, one of man's greatest inventions, was the symbol both of his first crude control of the rivers and the great revolution that came with it, farming. As this early control developed over the centuries into the complex art of irrigation, man shaped in the river valleys a new way of life. The nomadic hunter began to give way to a new kind of man, the herdsman and farmer, and among them grew habits of gentling, nurturing, and breeding. Containers to save water and food for lean times had made permanent settlement possible. With the ability to store things came continuity of life. And through the ages, the villages, containers of men, grew in stability and security. Each villager had his role to play at each stage of life. But all were directed towards the creation and care of life. It was natural then that the village reflected women's needs, women's intimacy with the processes of life. But this balance and harmony did not last. Over the centuries, as the villages multiplied and irrigation networks and the life they supported became more complex, the limitations of the village society became apparent. Suspicion, isolation, resistance to change. To face these new conditions, which could not be handled by the slow-moving council of village elders, the people probably turned to a rejected element of the farming society, the nomadic hunter. Under his authoritarian leadership, a more complex and dynamic pattern of life emerged. There was a change in the purpose and direction of life, as well as a change of size and scale in the transition from the village to that new container, the city.
In the field of techniques, the city mobilized manpower, fostered large-scale engineering, long-distance transport and communication, and an outburst of invention unparalleled until our own time. In politics, the hunter leader became the hunter king. Kingship appears with the city. Village neighbors were reduced to subjects. But at some point, the king's control brightened into justice, making possible a society with uniform laws. But without religion, the city could not have controlled the citizens. To achieve willing obedience, the rulers of the city must have awakened some degree of affection and loyalty. Here, religion played an essential role. And over the centuries, the hunter king became the priest king. Religion made city life bearable for the average citizen. Now no longer an equal member of a village community, but a voiceless subject whose chief function was to support and enrich a dominant minority. At first, the king held all common property in trust for the citizens. But later, the nobles, for services rendered, were given this property. And property rights acquired a special sanctity within the city. The stratification of society widened the gap between the rulers and the ruled but it helped to produce the specialization of work and opportunities for leisure that were devoted to sculpture, music and art, and the other triumphs of man's intellect and emotions which we have inherited from the first era of city building. Arithmetic, geometry and the calendar the development of writing and codes of laws, the adventure of astronomy. In all these ways, the city was closer to heaven than the village. But the city was the seed of something else unknown to village life. The rites and cults of a community are outlets for its anxieties. As the city magnified people's creative potentials, it magnified also their anxieties. The fertility rites of the village were magnified into the cult of physical power expressed in war. This was the darker face of the city. Organized warfare appears in history with the city. As with the kingship and the city itself, war gained worldwide diffusion. After the Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold of Babylon, Sennacherib's boast read, the city from its foundations to its top, I destroyed, I devastated, I burned with fire.
the positive forces of cooperation and communion have brought the people back again and again in history to repair their ruined cities and to start life again. Until now, the creative spirit that flourishes in the cities overcame each devastation and linking together the past and the future gave people faith to build anew on the old ruins. Each historic civilization begins with a living urban core and too often ends in a graveyard of dust and bones. Yet until now, the living seed of the city might still lodge in the ruins and grow once more. But that day is over. The cosmic violence of nuclear weapons would do more than wipe out our cities, or would also break up the pattern of cooperation between all living organisms on which man's own existence depends. The thermonuclear blast that may destroy our cities would likewise blast, scorch, and poison the fields, forests, and waters upon which all life depends. Once these are gone, there will be nothing to survive with, as well as nothing to survive for. No Rotterdam, Warsaw, Coventry, Dresden, Hiroshima would rise again. No one dare hope that New York or Montreal would bravely come back to life. But even if we are saved from thermonuclear destruction, our cities today are endangered by other forms of destruction, only slightly slower and slightly less devastating. Our nuclear weapons are only a special case of the tendency of a one-sided and overpowerful technology to escape its natural controls and its human direction. Today, as before in history, physical power, unqualified, almost omnipotent, dominates the city and its region. And so the image of the city appears dim and confused and threatening. This cataclysmic power reaches out, flattening whole landscapes in a purposeless drive for expansion, blotting out historic institutions, blurring fine networks of human cooperation, spawning formless and shoddy communities unworthy of the name on the city's fringes where real human needs are ignored in a monotonous wasteland without purposeful human design. The city's progress is marked by superabundant and masterful engineering without the human end in view and a domination of people by their own machines. of the city is a mass of disposable containers for living and working, where life-promoting elements are subordinated to a life-curbing routine, where the human scale is forgotten, and where power, insolent, irrational, dehumanized, threatens to make sterile man's most precious collective achievement. In exalting power alone, 
Such a civilization foreshadows its own end. And in human terms, it makes little difference whether the destruction is produced by uncontrolled urban expansion or uncontrolled nuclear devastation. But no inexorable fate has decreed that the city must end as it began in an underground shelter or a burial ground. The forces of life are still mighty and the promise of the city of man need not be lost.